episode, JM and I are going to take some of your guys' questions. I put the call out a number of episodes ago to uh, fire your questions at me. I picked the best ones, and JM's really busy, so uh, I really appreciate him taking the time to answer these questions. We kind of picked the ones that I thought were the best, most important, would offer the most value to um, people who are farming. Okay, so you guys sent a bunch of questions for Jam, which is awesome. Thank you so much for that. I kind of chose the ones that I thought were the best. There were some questions in there that you could just search Google and find the answer for, so I usually don't take the time to answer those let questions. Let me show you how to Google this. Let me, show, let me Google that for you. Okay, so uh, one question, you know, I was here yesterday looking at the hedgerows and stuff, and you guys have done this awesome, these hedgerows in between all your 10 foot or, or uh, 10 bed blocks. And it's all like perennial stuff, pollinator stuff. How, how is that working out? Is it measurable? Like, how do you notice? Okay, so first of all, this is a research farm, so we had the means to do stuff that perhaps normal farmers wouldn't do. They wouldn't afford to be able to time or the cost to and do. And the other thing is being involved with uh, the permaculture scene and Diego from, from Permaculture Voices and hanging out with all these designers all the time, a lot. Of, I was influenced a lot by that kind of way of seeing things, and yeah. so I wanted to see what permaculture design, how that could fit into a market garden yeah. uh, the, uh, project, and yeah. so f figuring out the sweet spot between both. And so the hedgerows is what I think has the most, the biggest value proposition. And the hedgerows were designed to host beneficial insects or uh, birds. birds that will you know, mitigate the problems of certain insects that are your enemies. Yeah. And so there's guilds of different plants that were selected because, become, because they attract beneficials. Yeah. And the whole purpose is to create an ecosystem in the market garden where there's so much biodiversity, so many different insects, bugs, and it's all been kind of planned and, and worked about that in the end, we should have a lot less insect pressure. Yeah. But to answer your question, this is year one. Yeah. So it's, so it's, it's going to take to it's going to take more time. Yeah, because you're still using insect netting. You're, yeah, you know that's the thing too. People think, and not to discredit the idea of hedgerows, because I think it is a fantastic idea, and more research needs to be done to see if it's viable. Yeah. But a lot of people in the permaculture community assume that you can avoid all pest problems on a farm by just simply having beneficial bugs around, and they'll solve all your problems. That's not the reality. Okay, so that's... Might be, though. It, it might, might be. be. It, it might. In, in, in 10 I, years, I, we might say I, yes. I, I think you guys will see... I think Curtis has shots of these hedgerows. Yep. I can just tell you this. If this doesn't work, I don't know what will. Okay, because... <laughs> yeah, this, what else could you do? This is pretty much overkill. Yeah. There's there's every... <clears throat> there, every 45 feet, there's a hedgerow. Yeah. And the reason why that is is because the hedgerows are four feet high. Yeah. And they're they're acting as windbreaks also. Yep. And windbreaks, you know, it's 10 times the height. That's the protective uh, capacity of a windbreak. And so my field blocks are 40 feet. So that You mean 10 times the length. Yeah. Yeah. So if if the if, yeah. the if the if the windbreak is 4 feet then you got 10 feet of buffer. I've got after 40 that. feet. 40 feet of buffer, of buffer after that. Right. So that's the reason why that went that way. And so yeah. you know, there's a lot of things that we're going to be playing it and if people are following what I'm doing on this farm, there's going to be evolutions in the next few years. Of course. And when I do start another project, it's going to be pretty much bang on. Yeah. Because I've experimented with a lot of stuff here, things that are going to be home runs and things that aren't Absol going to yeah, be. Yeah, absolutely. But we're learning a bunch. Yep. Yeah. So that's that's a good answer to that yeah. question. Uh, this is probably a quick one. The JP3 with the three with the three jangs put together. You like it? Okay, JP3, I went that route because it goes three times faster than the single one. Especially for your 100 foot beds, right? So that's like mechanic. Yeah. Okay, so I'm all about trying to do it faster. The flip side is that now we've had to standardize some of the spaces in six rows per 30 inch beds. Yeah. So we're not doing seven, we're not doing eight, and we're yeah. not doing four or five. Yeah. We're doing six. Yeah. I think six is good enough because we can work on the the distance between with the roller with, with the just rollers your roller or the gears. Uh, but there's fine tuning there. Yeah. But overall, considering that we're you know we're doing, it's not unusual that we seed 20 hundred foot beds in a week. Right. 
So it does it's save a, a lot big, of time. Big time and, and the Cedar per se works just as well as any other Jang. As the Jang, yeah. yeah. And that's that's the thing that's an important piece about context because JM's got his farm is 10 times the size of mine, so for me to use a JP3, there's no point. No. My beds are shorter, I'm not planting 20 beds a week. So it's all about context, and so it's neat to see how those adjustments are made for that context. The farm here has 450 100 foot beds. It's a lot of beds. That are turned three or four times, times per year. Yeah. So that's high rotation, guys. Uh, so that's a lot of. It's a lot of production. It's a lot of production. Yeah, it's three times the amount of a farm this size. But most farms would have tractors this size. Yeah. So it's really probably 10 times the amount of production that you get of a farm this size. Can I say a word about tractors? Yeah. Still doesn't need one? Because that was another question in here. Somebody was asking, it looks like you're using tractors now. Okay, I'm using a tractor to haul the compost. compost. To move compost. That's it. And, and we have electric carts to get the produce and move around the farm. Yeah. Uh, cultivating with a tractor, I still don't understand why. Um, make my beds, my, my beds are made. Yeah. Like I don't, I don't play around with the beds. Yeah. I still tarp them and I still use the power harrow on the BCS. Yep. And that's not my bottleneck. And I don't think it's gonna be my bottleneck. Yeah, so nothing's really changed no. from the grillinette to... Except processing, handling, and harvesting. Way because different there. shit, we're doing so much more produce. Yeah. So the bottleneck was the washing station and the packing, packaging and handling. Yeah. And that's, if you visit the farm, that's where most of the money was put. Yeah. To have something that has wheels and that is really well thought about. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's actually talk about that now since we're on the topic. The, the, the processing station, the post-harvest, I've got some clips in there that I can roll over this, but what, you know, what, um, what kind of new innovations are you guys doing in that in the post-harvest scenario? The wheel? The spinner? The wheel. Having carts and uh, things. On like, wheels. Fucking shit, <laughs> The man. wheels. We didn't have wheels. On yeah. my farm, we were just kind of, the washing station was on, was on a, like poor concrete, really rocky. Yeah. And to have, be able to roll out the roll produce. Things, so much easier on your back. Yeah. Everything, uh, I don't want to say stainless steel because it's really expensive, but everything washable. Like you yeah. can spray the shit out of everything. Yeah. I think that's, that's good. And um, like I've really liked, I've told you this a couple of times, we bought everything from Uline. Yeah. I kind of like that. Because everything's standardized. Everything's standardized. Yeah. And, yeah. and they offer us solutions on many things because these guys are shipping, handling, and processing experts. All the time. Yeah. Industrial grade. Yeah, yeah. So I, I've been a big fan of Uline. Yeah. Um, and then there's all sorts of little micro details. You've got a carrot washer in there. You've got a really skookum salad spinner, big bubbler. Shut off valves so that yeah. you can fill your water tanks without Really them high off. pressure sprayers high for pressure, washing. Uh, bigger cold rooms, uh, pallets. Concrete floor for spraying and washing off. All sorts of different yeah. things. And, and I think that that's, that's a nice evol evolution. Yeah. As, as you expand and you process and sell and harvest more, the washing station becomes an important part of the. It's, it's, of, of it's so critical. It's the big. In my experience with market gardens, it's the biggest bottleneck because market gardens have so much buffer that they can increase their production on, besides taking on more land. Like I've been talking about this for years. You know the same thing. You can get more production by just going higher rotation on your beds, tightening your crop cycles. That your bottleneck is going to be where that all ends. Yep. You can increase production on an acre for a year without taking on more land or years, but you need to increase your processing and post-harvest infrastructure. So I would advise before buying that, you know, $50,000 Kubota tractor, fucking put, put that money in your, in your washing in station. your washing station, absolutely. Okay. That's, that's really good advice, guys. So. Yeah, I like that. Okay, so um, somebody asks, are you gonna write another book? I we think you are. Uh, uh, 2032 was the date. 2032. It'll be all about this farm, right? Is that the idea? Yeah, it's just like I feel that it takes writing a book takes a lot of time. It takes a, at least now. A year. I'm fully engaged in making making this this uh, farm fully functional. Perhaps in five years, I might step back and and reflect on what we've done here and and try to share some of that. Yeah. So for now, it's not in the plans. Right. Okay. We might do an online course, but I'm not sure. Yeah. We talked about that for a while too. Um, so the, the Ramiel wood chips in the in the footpaths. This is something that I'm interested in. 
A lot of people ask this question, I want to know myself, how's that working out? And I understand that it's hard to get yeah. a full picture only a year okay. in. So, the ramule wood chip that we put in the beds is for one reason, two reasons. The first is we, we want to inoculate the soil with micro organisms, uh, micro fungal, fungal micro, uh, the, the mycorrhizae, mycorrhizae. Yeah, micro, mycorrhizal. mycorrhizal, okay? Yeah. And there's a lot of evidence out there that says that this is so beneficial for the soil and for the crops. Yeah. So you need to do your own research about that, okay? Right. Yeah. But the other reason is because we're trying to boost the organic matter as fast as possible. Yeah. And that's a good way to do it. Because you're going to rotary plow it back in? Or or just leave it there. Just leave it there. We, we yeah. You know, it, it's going to end up in the same kind of environment anyway. Right. And I've always talked about getting high organic matter fast. I still believe that. Second year of operation, this farm organic matter, 12%. That's really good. And now yeah. we can we can we can surf on that for 25 years. Yeah. And perhaps Curtis, in another uh, post, whatever, he can talk about one of our strategy for that. Which, yeah. Which is kind of haul, overhaul new soil in. Right. Yeah. And fucking just get it done, and, yeah. and then just yeah. cranking it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's it's it's great. Um, somebody is asking about. Have you experimented with winter type brassicas in cold frames, like winter broccoli, cauliflower, and stuff like that? Uh, I, it's funny, no. Uh, since I'm following in the Curtis Stone playbook, I try to not have these crops that <laughs> yeah, are not Yeah, they're low value good. crops. I would have answered that question, but I wanted, I wanted to hear, get it from you. Same answer. We're trying yeah. to maximize space and time. And, and production profit. And so yeah. I haven't targeted these crops. Not to say that in the future we might, we might not try them. I think Matt Kofay did them in tunnels. Wasn't he doing stuff like that? Uh, Anyways. We're, 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 you know, we're high on spinach and we're high on salad mix and we're high on huckernite. You're high, huckernite on, you're high on high value. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, because we're trying to Long milk this baby value. as fast as possible. Yeah, totally. Um, somebody asked a question here. If you only had seven crops to grow year round, what would they be? Salad mix, seven. Yeah. Salad no seven Salanova. sins, seven days, seven <laughs> Yeah. Seven deadly sins. Seven deadly crops. Okay. Seven is a it's pretty interesting. It's, number. A, it's a round number, Satan. yeah. Yeah. Um No that's okay. six six six. That's six, okay. Uh <laughs> <laughs> fuck it. What, 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 what's the question? Salad mix. Salad mix, huck rye turnips, yeah. uh French radishes, yeah. uh baby beets. Yeah. Um uh, tomatoes, heirloom tomatoes. Yeah. Uh, cherry tomatoes. Yeah. Mix colors, yep. cherry tomatoes. Yeah. I like kale because we can really go a long time with it. Yeah. So that's why it's in it's in my seven. Yeah. Um, and one more would be carrots. Carrots. Yep. We are gangbusters with carrots that are harvested fresh. Yeah. And harvested in frozen ground. Yeah. Fresh. Yeah. People are going berserk. Uh, yep. Elliot Coleman style. It does work. Oh yeah, and uh, yeah, carrots. Yeah. yeah, okay, that's a good one. Because um, sometimes it's not just the value per square foot; it's it attracts the clients. People talk about it, and then they buy other stuff. Yeah, and so there's all sorts of reasons. But these would be my seven. But I would actually have twelve. Yeah, because what else would you add in there? What would be well, the other five? Well, I, I would I would do I would I like. You know, I think cucumbers, we make a lot of money with them. Yeah, with like, greenhouse cucumbers. Uh, yeah. cu we got uh, bell peppers, we do a lot too when we have them. It's like... But the, you can't do those year round though. No. That was the question was about what's year round. Because like even tomatoes, you can really push it. I mean, right now their tomatoes are pumping, but you know, yeah. you can't really do those year round. Yeah. So I mean, I, my, my thinking on that question is what's like the green stuff, yeah. the root crops okay, well, that you well, can do year round. For me, year round, doesn't involve January, February. Yeah, and it, those are dead market months anyway. Because yeah, everybody's kind of like fucking depressed here in Quebec. And <laughs> everybody's watching the hockey. Yeah, so, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. It's kind of a okay. Fair enough. Um, now, in the other greenhouse, the heated greenhouse with the with the tomatoes and all that, you have a really cool hydronic system of putting hot water in underground. underground with PEX yeah. tubing. Yeah. Um, how did that go? How did it work? Was okay, so this was meant to really uh, speed up the um, biological activity in the soil comes springtime. Yeah. So what happens, 12 degrees in Celsius, I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, is the threshold where 
the organic, the soil activity starts to, you know, happen again. Move around, yeah. So when we transplant early March or end of February, our tomato plants, we want the soil to be active and dynamic and alive. So that's why that's there. Yeah. So we're not really heating the, the greenhouse, we're just heating up the soil so that it's it's happening. To get it started faster. Yeah. It's not so much about pushing it into the winter, because you're not running it right now. No. It's, it's more it's, about it's a kick getting, in. it's a kickstart. But it, but what, what what that will do is that we'll be six weeks earlier from people that are only heating the house. Yeah. Yeah. So it makes a big difference in Huge the Huge difference yeah. on the jump start to come in really strong. Yeah with almost summer style production in that things and, are growing and, fast. And that's and gonna be early May. Yeah, that's really great. Like, and, and end of March, early May, we're like, boom. Yeah. Things are like in the summer. Things are rolling. Cool, that's all we have time for today, guys. I gotta go and teach his crew how to do microgreens, and we gotta run out in the rain. All right, I hope you found that helpful. If you wanna see more stuff like that, please hit the subscribe button right now. Like and share these videos with your friends. Check out my website at theurbanfarmer.co and JM's website at the link below. All right, we'll see you next time.